topic is basically Bitcoin micropayment channels that are extended in such a way as to uh, permit indirect payments. Uh, and then this is just one other, you know, uh, like a couple other ideas for extensions. And so um, part of the motivation for this is that Bitcoin as it stands, uh, its transaction limit uh, on the blockchain is about seven transactions per second. The, the alternative for micropayments, or the several alternatives for, micro, for micropayments that exist, um, one is basically centralized micropayments like what Coinbase permits, and another is uh, what Matt wrote uh, as far as what Bitcoin J and what uh, uh, MCP, which uh, Jeff Garza wrote, uh, uh, from one party to a single predefined party. So the, um, the issue with that is that you only have one single predefined party. So uh, an extension, and I'm sure I'm not the only one that's thought of this. I know that Patch has, has uh, come up with the same thing independently. Uh, Joseph was the one who told me about it. Joseph. Uh, but, but the idea is to uh, is to set up uh, a way to indirectly pay from one party to another by an intermediary that cannot, uh, uh, that can't take that. So, uh, there are some issues right now with, with, uh, with the terms of payment networks, and there's a settlement network if you have a So, this is my question. So, uh, the existing of blockchain micropayments, they can actually be used for a lot of different stuff. You uh, don't just have to trade Bitcoin as, uh, you know, as defined. Uh, you can trade public coins the same way. Uh, but again, the biggest problem is that we have a single predefined party. Uh, so I'm about to go into kind of a review of uh, the way that the existing system works. And uh, please stop me if you have any questions or corrections. Uh, and I've only got like seven slides total, so I'm going to be talking, and it's, I'm relying on you guys to ask questions or bring up uh, ideas for discussion. Anyway, this is the uh, this is the existing micropayment system. I hope you can see this, but if not, then I did put it up on a slide share. Um, I don't have the URL inside there because obviously to do that I would have had to already put it up on slide share. Um, but uh, so the the idea of a payment channel is that you lock. Uh, a certain amount of funds into two of two transactions. Let's say Alice, is, Alice and Bob would like to be able to pay each other over a over a payment channel. Um, uh, they can both lock in some money, or just one of them to lock in some money. But the idea is that you have a two of two output that both parties have to sign. Um, uh, before that contract transaction is broadcast, a refund transaction should be created with an end time in the future. And the idea for that is that if one party goes away, then you can still get your money back. Or each party can still get their money back by broadcasting the refund transaction. And then to make payments back and forth, um, and, and so, uh, yeah, to make payments back and forth, as you see in the third, um, you can basically send, you can modify a refund transaction by changing its end lock time, maybe increasing its speed, uh, or, uh, yeah, so changing its end lock time, increasing its speed, and then reassigning the values of the, uh, reassigning the values of the outputs so that the payee gets less, or the payee gets more and the payer gets less. Uh, in the so again, the, uh, the the issue is that you only have one single predefined party. So you've got to have those full on-chain transactions for anybody that you want to transact with long term, and you can't 
can't do this with arbitrary parties without a lot of steps. Uh, as, as people have started thinking about this, uh, many Rosenfeld, uh, Mike Byrne, and others have uh, described the idea of micropayment networks, or micropayment channel networks, where you've got a, uh, a central-ish, almost like a hub, and then it has relationships with multiple uh, with multiple payers and payees and they can pay to and from through the hub. The issue with that is that it requires trust. Um, the, the, what you trust is that the intermediary doesn't steal a payment. Um, it's not that big an issue for micropayments, but it is an issue for larger payments where you're doing this for a day to make sure that your fees are low and to get the payment to be instant, like in a brick and mortar type sales situation. So again, with, with this type of setup, we have to have an intermediary. Um, so I, I began thinking about the problem of how do you eliminate uh, the requirement to trust the intermediary to pass on the payment, so that you can lock, so you can lock the payment uh, in such a way that the uh, intermediary can't take it. Uh, until it's passed on the payment to the to the actual pay, the, so that you don't have to trust the correction. And what I came up with is the idea of uh, almost an escrow micropayment, where each output is uh, encumbered not only by the private key of the person that it's going to be owning that output, but both outputs are encumbered by the exact same hash, where a hash pre-image has to be published in order to redeem those outputs. So the idea is this has almost like an escrow-like effect on the micropayment itself. And so if you have the intermediary pass on a payment to the next guy um, with the exact same uh, hash encumbering that, encumbering the outputs for that, um, then you can give the hash three image to the merchant, and as soon as the merchant, um, uh, as soon as the merchant uh, gets the payment covered with that hash, uh, the, the merchant can give the hash free image to the intermediary. Alternatively, you don't have to give that to the merchant. You can you can wait if you're if you want to do escrow directly. You can wait until the merchant gives you your merchandise or whatever, and then you can release the, the hash free image. Hopefully, does that make sense? Uh, that's the that's basically the long story. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's, it, it really is that simple. Um, there are a lot of caveats. For one, and this is a, this is an issue with existing micropayment channel type systems, where or any contract type system where you have a move on transaction, there's still uh, ways to, um, and Matt can probably talk more about this than not necessarily right now, but, but Matt has been uh, paying attention to uh, basically transaction malleability in that the refund transaction, um, uh, the refund transaction references the TXID of the contract transaction. Uh, and so the, um, so if somebody mounts the contract transaction, the refund transaction is no longer valid. Um, there are some workarounds. Um, I haven't looked close enough to talk intelligently about them, so I'm going to avoid that topic for now. But it's, a, it's a great topic for discussion. Uh, uh, so the, the other part of it is that if the intermediary drops out and decides to lock up that. Uh, to lock up that money until the the most uh, recent uh, until the most recent uh, uh, payment, meaning the most recent refund transaction version uh, is is able to be committed to the blockchain. Um, so for that, uh, my idea for the solution is a risk deposit where each side to the payment channel would deposit an uh, equal, equal amount to the entire payment channel. Uh, and then both sides have a goal, have uh, motivation to, uh, uh, to, to make sure that the payment channel gets set up correctly. Uh, 
Sorry, could you which which problem are you trying to solve with that? Um, with the uh, with the risk deposits. Yeah. Um, so the idea is that if you have if, if you have say uh, a merchant, a customer, and an intermediary, if the intermediary decides to drop out and basically refuse to sign any future versions of, of transactions. Um, the idea is that the intermediary's money is also locked up in the same way as the merchant's or customers. And even if you fill that in the channel, um, what you agreed to uh, in terms of um, how big the payment channel is, each side still has a deposit at least as big as that payment channel in order to uh, in order to motivate them to settle that that, that channel uh, as quickly as possible. <laughs> So what, what's the duration of the risk? Uh, the duration the of the risk is as long as your NMOC, as, as long as the soonest NMOC time. Um, and so one of the, one of the, so in practicality, what's a good block time? Um, it really depends partially on how much you trust your intermediary, partially on how big the, uh, the payment channel is. It could depend on um, it, it should depend on uh, network fees, uh, like the, the general fees that you pay to establish and tear down the channel. Um, you want to get your money's worth because if you're just doing a couple of transactions, the, 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 the fee for the transaction will be uh, one fee for all the transactions in the channel. Um, that's part of the idea. So, so if 10 people are doing a transaction, you're paying for the one fee. Yes. Sure. Um, so, uh, one of the things that I think you bring this up that I'd like to mention is um, when, so, so the idea is that every payment is essentially a new version of the, of the refund transaction. And so you want to make sure that the refund transaction that's related to the blockchain is the most recent one because otherwise, uh, uh, because otherwise there's, there's a motivation on both sides to cheat and maybe try and, and broadcast the transaction that's more advantageous to them in a version of the refund transaction. Um, so there are two ways that, that you can that you can encourage uh, that you can encourage the most recent transaction to be or the most recently signed version of the refund transaction to be broadcast. Uh, one is to decrease its end lock time so it becomes valid to the end of blockchain earlier. And the second is to slightly increment the fee for the transaction. So if you look at the different versions here, and I'm going to start with that, um, if you look at the end lock time on this, with every refund transaction, uh, the end lock time gets decremented by some number, and I showed you just five blocks for the example, but it doesn't happen. And with every version of the refund transaction, I would also increment the fee. The, um, and it doesn't have to be instrumented by much. And again, I just I, I kind of wrote this when Bitcoin is worth a bit less. Um, so, sorry. Oh, no, sorry. They're coming to so never mind. Um, no, because the, uh, uh, the, the how much money each side is putting in is set by the, by the initial transaction. So that's where you lock the money in. Uh, when you're implementing the fee, it's a new version of the refund transaction. So what you're really modifying is how much less money one of the outputs gets. And the payment channel can never exceed Correct. Um, the the other thing that, that can make these last longer if you want them to is that you really only need to do this when you're switching the direction of payments. And that's because if you if the person that's paying signs the version of the refund transaction, the other side that's being paid is already incented to only redeem the one with the most money going to them. So when you switch directions and the person that's got the most recent transaction that's advantageous to them uh, now has an incentive to try and cash in that refund transaction. Am I okay in the camera? 
Yeah. You're okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, when, when the yeah, so so when the person that is now beginning to pay uh, is is paying the other way, uh, in the future they have an incentive to to cash in the refund transaction that's most advantageous to them. Uh, so if you if you um, reduce the end lock time to make that transaction valid sooner. And if you increase the fee so that just in case the end lock time expires, miners will still prefer the most recent transaction because it's uh, fee per kilobyte goes up and then you reduce that risk as well. So as you see, this one is uh, the, the end lock time goes down by about five blocks. And let's say the, the next payment goes uh, uh, the next payment, I showed it being reversed, and a lot of time goes goes down again. I like how that problem solved two solutions. I'm sorry. I like how that problem has two solutions. But it, it does, and it's probably best to combine. Right. And one thing I should also mention on the contract transaction. This is something that Peter Todd has suggested to the Bitcoin development list. I think it's good practice for just about any transaction. Uh, is when the subsidy goes down, there uh, there's an incentive for miners to potentially uh, steal fees by rewinding the blockchain and, uh, and basically rewinding all of the new transactions and, and saving their fees. Um, if you set the end lock time to basically the next block, then that that defeats that that defeats their ability to steal any, uh, any transactions that have already happened because they've done rewind and replay the blockchain or remind the blockchain all the way up to where that new transaction is found. So if, if everybody uses that, then that takes a little bit of the blockchain and, uh, um, when uh, the subsidy goes in. It's a long-term issue, but I, I figured I would already add that to my personal information that I've already had. So, so um, that's that's the solution as it is. Um, because because uh, your intermediary basically uh, is a semi-centralized entity in that um, multiple people have to be connected to it, or multiple entities, I should say, have to be connected to it um, in order to route, route payments through it. Um, that's a good place for regulators to squeeze. Uh, so they, they can be regulated. It, it is regulator and bank friendly. Um, that can be tax friendly as well because you're you're essentially trading Bitcoin for Bitcoin. So it's property for property, and that's a different Bitcoin exchange. But on the other hand, if you have more sophisticated routing and maybe higher risk deposits, um, and, and we'd like to use uh, kind of a more friends friend type uh, network structure that's less central. Um, trust is still minimized, so you can still have a less regulated counterpart. Does that make sense? Uh, could the intermediary be a smart contract? Um, the inter no. So, so the smart contract is basically the, the two of two output and then the modifications of the refund transaction. Um, you can, but, and I'm about to talk about another, not necessarily right now, not going to go into this, but in a little bit, I'll talk about another application of the same kind of thing, where it's it's a it's also a, a different type of contract. But what you're really doing is just messing with the refund transaction and the, uh, the criteria that are required in order to redeem the outcomes of that transaction. Does that make sense? Yeah, just that you actually should buy it's like private keys, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's got to be something that that has private keys and then uses them to uh, sign sign payments. Okay, the source code is terrible. Just, just that right. is a demonstration. Yes, yeah, it's a demonstration, but I'm passing private keys back in class instead of. <laughs> it was just a, the, the quickest I could get it out and, and kind of illustrate the concept. It's not production ID. It's not even. It's not even a really test for it. It's just a demonstration. Yeah. Um, how do you find the most efficient path through the intermediary? Um, so as far as payment network architecture, um, because these are basically networks of payment channels, 
I kind of think considering two, and I know that Catch has the preference for one. Um, so, and I have ideas for what to do with the other. Um, so, um, the, the easiest and most centralized and most regulatable way that the government will love, and actually it's more efficient, it's more cost effective, it's easier to, it's easier to implement, is to basically have a pretty much fully meshed network of intermediaries and then have the actual customers and merchants, um, the payers and payees, uh, choose their favorite intermediary and, and you basically have more tops from from you to your intermediary, to your intermediary to the merchant's intermediary, and then from that intermediary to the merchant. Uh, with a larger network that's less fully meshed at the core, um, there would have to be some sort of routing algorithm. Um, uh, I'm thinking like a DHT similar to what CJDNS uses to, to uh, route traffic. Um, there are obviously the more issues, the, the more hops you have, the more chance there is for something to go wrong. Uh, if, and if you decide on a route and then try to send that and something doesn't work, uh, then you have an issue. Um, you have to reserve a payment channel uh, at each step of the path. So, if you, so the longer the path is, the more payment channels you have to, you have to reserve for that payment to go through. And until it's completed, it's not done. You know, is there any way you can envision to have all of the the entire chain of transactions operate as a, as an atomic transaction? That and that, that's the whole idea of the hash and the, um, the having to well, the pre image of the hash in order to uh, in order to uh, commit or in order to redeem the output of the, the refund transaction. Yeah. So, so the idea is that let's say A pay, A wants to pay B for C. So when A pays C, uh, both outputs of the new transaction are encumbered with their private key or uh, with their public keys, but also with a hash that, that the the pre, to which the preimage might be known. Only one of the parties knows that preimage. Uh, then when the uh, when the when when sorry when C pays B. Um, when it creates a new version of that refund transaction, both outputs also have to be encumbered with the exact same cash. And uh, and B, as the recipient of this, would check that they've got the exact same hash as the um, as, as the payer is using. And then, in order to make all of those outputs redeemable, the pre-images reveal um, And that give, that again gives you the option to use things like indirect escrow because it depends on who is generating the, the hash from the pre-image. So what I'm referring to, so that, that would work for like the clearing of the entire thing? Yes. But in terms of constructing the chain, in advance you wouldn't, in that structure you wouldn't have it, uh, uh, you wouldn't know as you're beginning to create this chain that every single hop was going to participate. Correct. So, um, the, and you're right, I probably should have put uh, some information on rollbacks here. But in the rollback, you can basically do a payment in reverse without needing to have a, uh, without needing to have a hash, uh, a hash there. So. So basically, if, if, if somebody stops and, or if somebody says, you know, I, I don't want to participate in this chain, I, I don't like it, whatever, um, uh, the way that they would roll back that, the way that they would roll back that payment is just to increment m log time by whatever number, increment the fee, and, and then basically switch directions for the payment, and you don't even have to use a hash. Uh, or a new, uh, a new hash to lock it with because nobody has, uh, only one person still has the pre-image of the hash. So everybody, in order to get their money back, has the incentive to roll back correctly. Otherwise, if, if, if you commit uh, a refund transaction that's encumbered by that hash, you can't uh, you can't redeem the output from it without knowing the Does that make sense? So thank you. This is why I'm relying on questions because I didn't think of everything when I was uh, 
Uh, I was kind of doing the presentation somewhat last minute. My uh, early in the week has been kind of busy, and I didn't get a chance to do as well on the presentation. Been very clear. Okay. But uh, yeah, there's uh, so there's a Bitcoin talk thread where some of the issues are are discussed, and uh, I've got another kind of a gist about a friend-to-friend a, a -friend based network that I'd like to build on top of this concept. Uh, almost like as a native app on top of Bitcoin uh, that, uh, that I explained to you with the same diagrams and in some detail, but it's, it's a lot better if you guys ask me questions, so I appreciate that. My last idea, uh, uh, and it uses a very similar construct, is to um, I know that some of you guys have seen uh, implementations of on-blockchain bets or derivatives that are enforced by the network. Uh, this structure lets you do the same thing, but it is a concept within the structure of a payment chain. And the way you do that is, um, again, you would cre well, you create multiple versions of the on transaction and have an oracle that, that publishes a statement, for example, that says, if Bitcoin is over $500 on November 1st, uh, I'll publish the pre-image to hash one, or if uh, Bitcoin is uh, less than $500 on November 1st, I'll, pre I'll publish the pre-image to hash two. And so if Alice and Bob, for example, want to bet on this, um, they will create two versions of a refund transaction with a lower end lock time and a higher uh, uh, higher fee, uh, but equal for both. And then uh, each one is valid for a different cash. Uh, and whichever um, uh, whichever party wins, the, the, that hash is revealed, and then, then that, that person can, gets the bigger output. Um, you can also do this in such a way that uh, there's a default outcome in that basically you need to pay in order to establish this, and then the only way the only way that this is valid, one outcome is uh, is for example the race, and you have a default outcome where you don't make any money, but you pay the fee in order to have the bet, and then you can have uh, if, if the right hash pre image is revealed, then you've got. Uh, one money. And so this can be used uh, for just about any kind of derivatives. Um, it can be used for uh, print to print trading of derivatives. Um, it, it can be used for, for example, bank type over the counter trading of derivatives between um, you know, basically print to print uh, without necessarily having to have a central exchange. If you have, if each node in that type of network is set up as a bucket shop that runs an alternative order book and, and uh, bets with uh, bets with its own funds, so you could have a distributed price discovery. Uh, I think that's pretty much the end of my Oh, yeah, I have a further reference, but if you guys have any questions, I'd like to answer them. Um, you have an oracle that, that promises to publish only one of a number of uh, hash pre images. Uh, so the hash pre image that's published has to correlate with the output. Um, if the oracle cheats and, and say the oracle is the counter is your counterparty and isn't telling you and then uh, then it tells everybody one hash and then it tells you the other hash then you basically have two of the oracle cheated because two of the hash pre images that are supposed to be mutually inclusive have been revealed. So you have at least uh, at least an incentive to uh, for for the oracle to have uh, you know, the reputation. Yes. Uh, well, yeah, or, or consistently live, but then you know they pre-announced which. Yeah, they used to verify secret share. I'm sorry. It just has to be like secret share. No, this doesn't have to be. The Oracle could over time uh, run up a notification that I was publishing the answers. And we could think that happen. I'm going to do a lie, but it's short of the next. 